Welcome back, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, in the front end, I'm going to remind you that if you like these programs and you like seeing these topics in religion, in politics, and language, you can support at patreon.com slash tawahedo. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. And if you are someone who's not allergic to reading, you can sign up for my newsletter at aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com. Today, our special guest with us is Subdeacon Hovan. How are you doing today, brother? Hey, how are you? I know. Good to see you again. Nice to see you too. By the way, you say my name with a perfect accent. That's so good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's good to see you again. You too. It's it's rare. It's it's funny. I had uh, an Armenian uh, friend, uh, and maybe one day she'll come on the podcast. But we were talking, and it's it's so interesting how there are so many commonalities. You know, people in the United States, especially nowadays, um, they rely a lot on ideas of like race as the number one identity marker, and it certainly has something. There's something there. But for me, my number one identity marker has always been Orthodox Christian, or as you say, that makes you an enemy of the state. You know that, right? Because <laughs> divide and conquer. Look, we got a big population in the United States, and it's really difficult to control a lot of cultures that are mixed together in this melting pot. If there's going to be some kind of a identity situation, that's the number one threat. So we're going to always be driven against each other. That's just going to be an easier way to collect taxes, I guess. I don't know how to say it. So yeah, it is. And I and I, you, you know, the Armenians say apostolic. We say orthodox or tawahedo, whatever it may be. We're in the same communion. And it, it's been so striking to me, you know, someone will post on Twitter or something like her or someone else, you know, this is a very Armenian thing to do. And I'm like, wow, that's a very Ethiopian thing that happens yeah. too, in terms of even like the the culture. And and I think it's because the culture is tied to to our religion a lot. But so I, I want folks back. to understand. What did you yeah, say? We go, we go way back. I mean, we have a very deep history together even before Christianity. So I think we got to, you know, about the big community of the Armenians uh, in Ethiopia. And uh, the emperor also delivered a lot of children from the genocide. I don't know exactly how many he brought over to save them from the tyranny, but we have a lot of history, and it's mainly from the church and yes. Jerusalem. Yes, okay. they had they had a band actually. A lot of the, there was a, a band of the Armenian children. They were very musical. Yeah. There were also several Armenian entrepreneurs. Actually, my father and all of his siblings, all of their godparents are Armenian. Nice, nice. <laughs> nice. All of them. Yeah, right. all of them. They were that tight. So when my grandpa was very close to uh, one uh, particular uh, family, the Vahak family. They're they're all over the world now. They're, some are still in Ethiopia, some in Australia, and uh, one I connected with actually in in England. So yeah, you're right. There's a lot of connections. But I want folks to to get to know about the diaconate more. In the Gu'uz tradition, mm -hmm. we kind of blended the diaconate so that you know you get a ten year old boy and he becomes an archdeacon. And in our liturgical rubric, we pray for the reader, the chanter, the subdeacon, the deacon, and the archdeacon. But practically speaking, I I've seen very few people appointed to reader, maybe a handful to reader, and then very shortly after to deacon. But I've, I've never seen the kind of the breadth of diversity that I see amongst the Armenians, Copts, and the Syriac. So I'm, I'm curious if you could tell my audience about how you like how you grew up in the church and how you eventually became a subdeacon. I assume you were a chanter and a reader first, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Now, I was a bad kid when I was a kid, but I was always a lover of Christ in my history. Like if I would go to school, I would always find a way to, you know, how am I going to disrupt the class again? That was really my homework. And how can I make the kids laugh? But I joined the church around 2007, 2008 when I realized I was no longer using my uh, natural instinct, my natural uh, inherited, how do you say, immunity from shunning away the evil and all the false Christs in my life. That's when I knew I had to get educated. And that's when I went to church for the first time. That's where my grandma went at uh, St. Peter's Armenian Apostolic Church. Before that, it was kind of natural. Yeah, we weren't following it religiously, but we knew exactly when to, you know, shun off all the false Christs in our life because especially in the Armenian church, we don't believe in this antichrist that's going to come. We just know there's a lot of false Christs that we need to protect ourselves from. So um, just like our, everybody's talking really deep into the 
the creeds and the different schisms and everything else. We just know who we are and we're not going to mix around with anything else that's alien. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, so, so that's when interesting. It was time so you didn't grow up educated. in it? Huh? Mm -hmm. You didn't grow up in the church going every Sunday or even on the, the big holidays? No, no, no. We did that. But I'm talking about going every Sunday and serving. Like uh, when I was a kid, my grandmother went. Uh, my father was close with the clergyman. It was just, uh, it was, it was in our family. It was embedded in our DNA. But whenever it was time for me to reconnect with everything that I lost, like hitting rock bottom and not understanding exactly where the attacks were coming from, I'm going to go ahead and educate myself. I started attending church every Sunday from 2008 to 2009. Up to 2010, I, I approached the priest and I asked him if I could serve. He, he accepted me. Um, the thing that really attached me to the church was we use an ancient language. It's called Gerapash. So I approached the church with all trust. I couldn't really understand the language that was being spoken. So with that, uh, the feel of the stimulation, you know, besides the frankincense, besides the icons, besides everything else, what are these people praying and chanting that's healing me inside? Until I started knowing the language very well myself. That's Beautiful. whenever I had to step it up a tier. Um, it was during the genocide of Kesab, I think, when the Armenians were being slaughtered that week. And I was about to head to the Coptic church for the first time. It was a really good opportunity for me to connect with a sister church because I thought, you know what? I'm already being broken. My back's going to break. I, I can't keep seeing this all over social media. Maybe I could reconnect to God the same way I reconnected to him last time. Whenever I was broken, only this time with the cops. I would be going there to reconnect to the same God with the language barrier and the culture barrier wall shattering. And that way, I won't walk around with so much hatred in my heart. And believe it or not, I got a lot more than what I thought wow. I could get. Because I, we were at the same Moses uh, monastery. Yes, I know that one. My heart melted, changed my life forever. I came back. They told me, you know, there's a Coptic church in Northridge, right? Yeah, I was like, all right, send me there. I'm going there every week. So Ath I, I Athanasius and Mary, I believe, in Northridge, and the one you're referring to is near Barstow and Newberry Springs, halfway yes. between uh, Vegas and Los Angeles. Yeah, that Barstow place, the monastery, that's my sanctuary. But I go every 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 week. I try to make it at the Northridge one by the St. Peter one at Van Nuys, mm -hmm. and I became regular there. I started. I'm not. I'm not going to say I was serving the altar. They don't need me, but I had the. I had the uh, privilege to join the deacons at the Holy Altar. And one time when we were going to the, but when I kept coming on Saturdays for the English liturgy, I was hoping I'd see an Ethiopian one with the language. You know, I got- Yeah, you, you came. Yeah. That's that's how, I don't know if, I think you and I knew each other before then on Facebook. I'm not sure. Or, or did we, was that the first time we met? Was when you no, came? The first time I came with a couple of guys to LA uh, for the Ethiopian church. Yeah. It was uh, Abba Thomas. I even remember the first uh, sermon he gave that I heard. So I usually get that first impression from that first sermon and it sticks with me forever. It was about um, the book of Enoch. He was oh, talking yeah. about that. Yeah. He the was one I'm named after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's when I met you. That's whenever I got to introduce myself and we became close ever since. You know, the first Ethiopian liturgy, it was with the San Diego. Takla uh, Haimanot. Uh, I know that yes. church. Yes. yes. They they, they uh, travel was, to the monastery a lot. They they travel to the monastery. I was going to go for the Coptic uh, liturgy. When I was outside the parking lot, I heard the chanting. I'm like, I know what that is. <laughs> and uh, my friend's like, well, we're going to the monastery over there where there's a Coptic. You would come and then you go, you leave me here. I'll, you guys go ahead. And I walked in. I, I had my Coptic garments on, but they still took me in. It was great. Yeah. Was great. For people who don't know, at the monastery the moses the strong is the biggest chapel they have but they actually have several chapels i think it's like five or four different chapels at the monastery so that that's what a uh, subdeacon is referring to you know moses the strong he has such weight on his shoulders you know what it means to bring water for the monks do you know what that means nobody can mess with someone like moses in the dark world i'm telling you right now he's the light bringer of the coptic church monastery in a place that um, fights probably the greatest of all evils. St. Moses is someone that um, I'm going to have to, I'm not going to bring a lot of detail, but he, St. Moses is strong. I don't think the strong is uh, strong enough to express exactly who he is. Have to stand up for the water like that. He's no joke. <laughs> he is no joke. 
um, he has had a very difficult past before joining the monks in the Coptic Church. And um, I think uh, a lot of people need to be educated exactly on what Christianity really is, according to the Armenian faith, according to the Ethiopian faith, according to the Coptic faith. Many people get caught up in, we're singing this first, you're singing this second. It's not the same. The faith is the same. The cultures are different. The experiences and the uh, calendars we hold may be different. We have different saints, different murders. And uh, what really matters is how the church holds those memories. Right now, the axe over our heads is to erase those memories. We were talking about a, a vision that uh, the cops saw at Zaytun with St. Mary for three days. I remember specifically telling the Abuna, I was telling him that uh, I've learned that it's not what vision we all saw together or shared or by ourselves. It's how the church later takes that experience and walks with it over the years. And every liturgy that's being read with that memory, that's what really makes us stronger. So even if it is full deception, it ends up becoming holy. It goes through this fire that the church could only walk through. So my main concern right now, I actually wanted to have this interview with you is because I, I want to get into the part where Churches are closed now. We don't have liturgy in this uh, coronavirus situation. But everything else could be open. What is it exactly that our church doors are closed for? I don't know if you want to talk about too much of that, but that's really what we, we can discuss it. Let's talk about the, the practical stuff first. Yeah. So um, tell us about the decision. You know, we... We have this saying from Ignatius of Antioch, which I mentioned in a previous episode, and a lot of Orthodox circles, they love this, right? Which is where the bishop is, there is the church. So we are a church that relies a lot on the structure and obedience to our to our bishops, and not just a single one, but the group of bishops that make the Holy Synod. What type of jurisdiction, you know, is your local parish under? Because I, I know there are there are a few. I've heard there's the jurisdiction in Armenia, but then there are some in Istanbul, formerly Constantinople, as well as Jerusalem, um, and and somewhere in, in Lebanon as well. And I'm wondering, do they all make the same decision in terms of closing the the parishes? And are or are are because I could tell you about the Ethiopian situation. The Ethiopian situation is we're pretty much closed down in in my diocese, which is Southern California. Um, until further notice, uh, I think may maybe one church or something like that, maybe they, they have a few people, but socially apart, whereas the other ones just have the clergy doing the liturgy and just sort of broadcast it and will open it for baptisms and funerals. So right. I just, as to the actual like specifics, what, what are the rulings that the, the bishops have made in, in your jurisdiction? I'm going to give you an example. There's an administrative part of the church and there's a spiritual part of the church. During the Soviet Union, whenever Stalin didn't like the cross very much, and he told us, put that cross off the church. Wow. Best believe me, administratively, we may have been on leave, but spiritually, the Holy Spirit made sure that cross went back up in less than 48 hours because dude had to sweat and everything, you know? So, yeah, it's going to be a problem when it comes to a uh, state or some kind of legislation to put their hand over the cross that's on top of the steeple. But that's a different story. If you're going to talk about the administrative authority, yes, there are different governments, there are different powers that the church is going to cooperate with. But uh, you already know religious freedom is not only equally distributed among the entire world, but it's in different neighborhoods too. So based on the religious freedom that other countries will allow us to have, there will be different administrations. But the authority is one. We have one Christ. We believe in the same Christ. The Constantinople uh, patriarch doesn't believe in a different Jesus than we do in Ejmiatsi or Kilika. We're the same Christians. We have the same faith. We have the same canons. Administratively, they may operate differently. That's only so there could be some kind of a uh, cooperation where we wouldn't be stepping on each other's toes, even though we're not walking the same path in the first place. So there's a lot more deep state to it than you think there'd be. So... I mean, I used to always think if we're not walking the same path, how are we stepping on each other's toes? But believe it or not, it's a lot more chaos to that than you'd realize. You've seen the Book of Enoch? No, no, the Book of Eli. The Book of Eli. Yeah, so Denzel. Do not let the Bible in the wrong hands, right? Same thing, man. <laughs> it's the same thing. It was, it was so, the most, uh, spoiler alert, the most incredible part of that movie for me is when he's he's laying down with his hands kind of crossed and it almost reminds you of this scene of like therapy which is so is that right when he's shaved? and is he recites it 
Is that what when he what? Off? Is that when his head is shaved off? Shaved off? Uh, probably. I don't remember that part. But you but know, that, yeah, that bald, one... you know why he's bald at the end, right? With him laying down and dressed in white. No, no, no. Why is he bald? Okay, in the scripture, uh, this is how I see. You could ask Denzel if I'm right or wrong. I don't know if you know him, but in the <laughs> end, you know how Christ says they will lay their hands on you and they'll persecute you. Yeah. I think that's the kind of scene right there because the Bible was with him the whole time. Yet yeah. they have to put their hand on him to get all their information. That's when he loses his hair like Samson does. Like he oh, kind of like forfe- interesting. Yeah. He forfeits his fight. He's not macheting people left and right anymore. And I don't think he's actually macheting anybody. But just to, sh- just to say those pages in his book, his every step that he's taking, he's no longer using his natural immunity from the church that he received to protect the Bible. He's actually using his testimony. Whereas someone after him will adopt that. Because Christianity constantly grows. It's not something that Christ did for us. If I'm going to be baptized in his name, then I'm already saved. No, that's just the beginning. So what am I going to do to make that spirit grow? So then tomorrow after me, someone will make it. That's why I like the book of Eli. It's a, it's a, lot, of, it's a lot of secularization to what is really happening from the beginning. I like that movie a lot. It means a lot more to me now than it did the first time that I saw it. Yeah, I have to rewatch it. I think I've only seen it once, but it was just the the impressiveness of the memorization of scripture reminded me of some of the work of the monks who some of them are doing it intentionally in our tradition. But some of them they just some of them it just happens because that's what their prayer life is like. Yeah, that's how it is. The, the monks are the true rebels. I mean, everybody in the majority say they're the rebels and the Christians are the goody goody people that want to go to heaven. But these monks or who are trying to be with the monks, they're the ones that are really the ones that rebel against the world. It's them against the world, and they're not going to be afraid of it. And they are actually going to the darkest places to deliver us from the dark. So, I mean, it's really, I mean, how can everybody be a rebel if they're all doing it together? In the 90s, I remember growing up in cartoons like Bugs Bunny and everything, they would teach us, if you can't beat them, join them. How do you grow up being a rebel today listening to satanic music with all of your other friends? I listen to it to fight it back if I do, but I don't. I don't like them so much. So, yeah, to me, the true rebels are the monks, and uh, they're not afraid of anything, pretty much. And that's pretty much what I want to be like when I grow up. I'm still an idiot. I got to grow. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, all, we're, all, we're all growing yeah. Uh, yeah. together. And actually, I remember one of the, the conversations, you know, speaking of the monk, right? The monk, the biggest thing they do is, is a very huge dedication to the liturgy. And one of the things you and I were talking about off camera a while back was there's this interesting thing, again, about how we're the same faith, but how we express it in certain unique ways, which is what I want to I want to highlight because I think that's there's a beauty in that, in the diversity of the tradition, and yet the tradition gives testimony to the same one God, which is that in the Ethiopian tradition, you know, we have 14 main anaphoras or liturgies in use, some people say that there are some manuscripts up to 20. I even heard another scholar recently say up to 30, which is, you know, it's crazy to think about how many there are. And you told me that in the in the Armenian church, you pretty much use one liturgy. So I was I was hoping you could tell us, and I, I, I didn't catch the pronunciation, so I'm going to butcher the pronunciation. Tell me the, the name of the, the, the language of the liturgy, Garbush. How did you say oh, it's, it? It's Garbush. It's the language of uh, writing. I guess Garabash. we don't speak it. We, I don't think we ever did speak it. It's Garabash. It's a language that's written for specifically writing and reading. You write it in the language, you read it in the language. It's the language we speak to God with, but it's not the dialects because we have a lot of dialects. Yes. And right now, the, the kind of vernaculars are, from what I understand are the Western and the Eastern Armenian. And how, how different are they from Garabash? Like, obviously, the, the script is the same. The letters are the same, but the is it like is you don't same. understand any of the words or you I understand, understand some of them. of them? I understand all of them. I could pretty much read it and know exactly what it's telling me. Would I be able to write poetry in that language? No, I don't know the I don't know the rules to it. No, 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 no. I you I mean, you obviously or... you pray in it all the time, so you know it. I mean the average native Armenian speaker, um, how how different is it? It's like do they understand anything or you have to just study the written language to understand it? You got to study it. If you're going to use it into creating more, you're going to have to study it. There's, um, I mean, something like the English language, if you're going to have to pick up a grammar book every three years to see what changes have been made in the language, not not, not much changes are made in the Armenian Garapaj, but uh, nevertheless, there are very strict rules that you need to follow by because um, 
the alphabet or the language itself when it comes to canon. There's a lot more to it than just uh, being uh, grammatically correct. It has to make more sense than just what you're expressing on that paper. Something that needs to be forever in a way. We're not talking about diamond rings here. It's, uh, <laughs> it's canon. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah uh, it, the language is going to be that way. The dialects are not just Eastern Western. Um, I got friends from France. My cousins. I got friends. I got my cousins from Germany. I got cousins from Turkey. I don't understand a thing they're telling me in Armenian, bro. It's, wow. I even have a video. I look back sometimes. I'm like, man, I got to learn how to talk English with my Armenian cousins because we don't understand each other's dialect. You know what I mean? Wow. A Persian, uh, the, the Persian Armenians, they have a funny dialect. They kind of sound like they're singing. I mean, I don't want to say it. Now they're going to smack me over the head when they see this video, but it's kind of, <laughs> it's like that, you know? So it's, um, we have a lot of dialects. We're an old people. We're an old culture. I like all of them. Whenever I want to, you know, do a passive aggressive threat to someone, I speak Berutsi, you know, because those guys are crazy. So, you know, it's like a different stuff, you know, it's just. I'm from what, what dialect do you speak? I'm, I'm supposed to be from Washington, D.C. I'm actually supposed to be an American Armenian, but I'm far from any American Armenian that's ever existed. I'm probably more attached to me going back, bro. It's just like I, I kept going back. I kept trying to find my roots through the church. And when I found my roots back from church, I actually don't even listen to hip hop anymore. I listen to Armenian rap back in Armenia. I, I like connecting with everything that's mine. Even some of it's going to be detestable. I just want to keep connecting because I think I got some kind of a connection that I'm going to be using very soon. Uh, it's going to be for the church. The reason I wanted to be more in communion with sister churches is because I'm going to tell you right now, I wanted to know how I could be a better servant for my church, how I could be in communion with Henok in the Ethiopian church at uh, LA or, um, my other brothers from the Coptic church and then come back to the Armenian church as a better servant, as someone that could bring more strength to my brother standing next to me at the altar. Um, we got a, we got great guys. Uh, they're not afraid of anything. They'll step up to anybody and uh, they're going to go ahead and do one thing as the number one priority is hold that cross up no matter how difficult things get, whether it's in school or on the streets or anything else. Our number one priority is the cross. We're going to hold that up. Here's my Coptic one. <laughs> We're going to hold that cross up. And it, it's not going it, to be a Christian. The worst, worst perception after the Soviet influence where we weren't allowed to be Christian was to be a Christian means you're going to have to bow your head and turn the other cheek. This is how I see about turning the other cheek, and many Christians would agree with me. I think you would agree with me, too. If you're going to wrong me as my brother, I'm going to turn my cheek long enough to see what's driving you to keep wronging me. But I'm not going to allow you or whatever's causing you to puncture my spirit or the bread and wine that we hold so, you know, holy and sacred to us. So. Turning the other cheek is a misconception from all of our enemies. People think that, oh, they're Christian. They're the easiest ones to mess with. It's not. I'm going to tell you right now. We're going to be very patient long enough to see what drives the forces, the people to be diabolical against each other. And uh, that's what I mean. You are talking right now. I'm going to look at all the conflicts that are happening right now. Right now? Right now. We could be a hope and a beacon to whatever conflict's happening. But we're also going to be hated the most. They will hate us. They will hate us, but they hated our Lord first. Nobody's greater than his master, but we shouldn't be afraid. Amen. We'll, we'll cast the fear out and we'll bring them the love of the liturgy. So can you can you tell us any part of the liturgy, whether it's your favorite part or any part? We just I, I want people to get a taste of the Armenian uh, liturgy. You can you can tell us the name. I believe it's uh, St. James, but please correct me. And um, any anything from the liturgy, I think would be great just so people could begin to experience the the tour that that you always go on between the sister churches. Uh, between the sister churches, I'm going to tell you about the Armenian one first. There is this one that was very uh, confused. I don't know about the favorite. I like a favorite. Um, there is this one Armenian song. But um, I used to sing it a lot when we were in a Catholic school in the Armenian church. Ask you every Friday we would sing it. And... Um, after I grew far from the faith, I kind of went my own ways. I strayed off and everything else. I had a dream where that song was being sung. Wow. The same day I was looking for the lyrics online and I couldn't find it. 
<laughs> and in my dream, I kept saying, sing me that song again so I could remember the words. Supposedly, I saw that dream that I kept singing the same song. And then I woke up and I knew the words. Then I go to the liturgy and I was singing that song with them. So it's not something that I learned the first time, but my memory came back in my sleep which was crazy. So that was my favorite part as a naive person that had to go back. But as far as it goes to the challenge I had to face, there was a, um, it's, there's this part where it says, hold back those that are uh, still in their repentance. Mi vok Keep the Holy Communion away from those who are not baptized yet. It doesn't mean child. It means those who are not baptized. Hold those away who are uh, still in their process of repentance. May they, re may they remove themselves from the gates as the Holy Communion is brought forward. Nobody follows that anymore. And all the non-apostolic Armenians, they go around telling people that the Armenian Apostolic Church doesn't believe in uh, repentance. Because that's and, and those are Protestant that's Armenians, or what are it they? It could be anything that's not apostolic. I'm not going to throw names out there. They, mm -hmm. they they go there one time. They see the translation. Or they think they saw the translation. Me vok hapashkarovats. Those that are still in the process of repentance, they read. They're like, oh, I apashkar. I repented. I put my hand up and I said, uh, Jesus Christ is my savior. I'm already saved. So now I can't have holy communion. That's we're talking about different things here. So they go around t setting those fires about our church. I like that challenge because it's really talking about how we're supposed to prepare ourselves before approaching this holiness. We got two versions of the liturgies. Number one way, where we pray together, we receive the Holy Communion. But during Easter Lent, unlike the Coptic Church where they receive Holy Communion every day, we only we don't receive Holy Communion during those 40 days. We fast. Wow. We fast. We do the liturgy. The liturgy is for those that are out there um, on a very specific uh promise to god okay the the altar's closed we're doing wow. liturgy behind the closed curtain everybody is still humbly bowing themselves in front of a closed curtain remembering the liturgy but every wednesday we have a different liturgy it's called sunrise peace services uh it's like jesus being in the desert because after saint john was before saint john was beheaded he said do not brag about being sons of abraham because out of these stones god will turn sons of abraham and then Christ was approached by Satan in the 40, year, 40 days in the desert, right? Where he said, uh, if you are God's son, and turn these stones into bread. As in, now I'm going to make sure you make that mistake that St. John promised you won't. You get what I'm saying? And he said, God must live, man must live by every word of God, not just bread alone. That's just one example of how Satan could really mess with your head. So we make that promise to make sure there isn't going to be some kind of deception happening spiritually when there is a change. Of some kind of a universal disturbance, like we face every day now. So that's the type of liturgy we experience during the forty days of Easter. Everybody fasts. Nobody receives Holy Communion. We take it a lot more serious. We kind of understand what it means to distance ourselves. At the same time, we protect ourselves more by not allowing ourselves to be tainted with other uh, stuff that we shouldn't be messing with. And uh, whenever the curtains do open, the entire problem-solving matter should be that whose eyes were they actually looking at the altar when the curtains were still closed? That's what we're trying to find. And there are many, many other deep uh, meditations of monks. Uh, there's a monk, Nersa Shnurali, where um, it's called Christ Child. Prince of the Princes. That's how some people revealed him to be as Christ Child. Uh, these kids are like they're not really kids. They're um, mm. these are children who constantly praise the Lord over and over again, and uh, in their prayer. And uh, these monks, they actually did the exact opposite. Instead of fasting, they went and ate all kinds of foods, so their bodies could be confused by the outsiders as someone else. So whatever they would try to do to the flock, they would use their bodies as shields. We've had that kind of uh, mysticism too, and we still do. And I don't want to get too much into it, but yeah. Um, many people would argue with this, so I'll open the book and I'll show them, but would I really would want to do that? I don't know. It doesn't matter. But <laughs> right now, our churches are closed. That's all I care about right now. So yeah. But uh, that's yeah, my favorite we... part of the liturgy. It's uh, all of it. During the Coptic... Uh, liturgies in Easter when it was every day I would attend to and uh, I, I tried to bring more to the table on both sides 
You know what I read? We know what I loved about the Coptic Church is, um, uh, unlike the Armenians, uh, there is a lot of division between the Ethiopians and the Copts. Right now, Ethiopians are being uh, heavily genocided too. As I've been seeing some stuff happening. Right? Yeah, I did. I did a video happening. on my Could channel be? about it as well. I, I want to get more into that too. There's a lot of bad stuff that's been happening in Egypt too, and um, I've realized the church. When I come in as a, someone that doesn't look anything like them, the, them looking at me with fear is the last thing I'd see. It's like they expected me to be there, dude. There is the, the under the knife of the xenophobia attack, the cops and the Ethiopians had the least effect on them, in a way. But even if they don't, you can't blame them. You know, um, people they react according to their wounds. So uh, I like the courage that Christ gives us as an inheritance. And uh, yes, there is also another side of the coin where the changing of the Christ is the worst sin of all. We're not going to allow that to happen, but we're also, we're not going to prevent us being in communion together. Our cultures may be different, but in one Christ, it is actually essentially the same. So... Um, what I'm trying to avoid, which we're going to have to run into a lot, is uh, the change of the faith itself. Not the creed, but the Bible, dude. Like the Armenian Bible is different than uh, the American NIV Bible. We've had a history before Christ in the Old Testament. When uh, they wanted King Cyrus to build a temple, before King Cyrus, they asked the Armenian King Artashes, Hey, help us build this te temple, you know? And King Arthur has said, yeah, I know you like killing a lot of kings. So no, go ask those kings over there. Leave me alone. Now, you know, so we've had that situation. So it's in our Old Testament. And then when King Cyrus built it, we had a different problem. So it's just, we've had that. Uh, we have an old history. Do you guys have but, uh, a common English translation that you use in the Armenian literature? Yeah, there is. Yeah, no, no, in the Armenian literature is basic. Everybody has the English translation. It's pretty much the Psalms of David, but it's fulfilled with Christ. So um, it, we use the Psalms of David in different parcels. Every line is basically the Psalm of David. There might be a name or two of St. Anthony, St. Moses, whoever is going to be in there, um, sung by the, uh, by the monks or the chanters. But the structure is really the Psalms of David. Uh, developed according to the testimony of the Armenian church, how we recognize Christ as the one true only God, even with our ancient past before and after. It doesn't matter. He's the first, he's the last. He is who we're going to hold up because he's going to bring us the uh, best example. If you don't love Christ more than your children, how are you going to love your children if you don't know what it means to love? He's our first example to know what love is. So people would say, no, my kids first. Yeah, but you don't know what you're doing when it comes to that. You're not driving a car, bro, you know? <laughs> so it's, you got to understand from first example what love actually is. Because in this world, um, when you don't use them as that first example, uh, what example are you exactly following to keep loving? Because you're going to be constantly questioning yourself, why? Why am I actually still patiently loving everybody I wanted to love? Because everybody's kind of, you know... They have this uh, gut feeling and they go with it. A lot of people are numbed out today. Nobody's sober anymore. Those that are in constant meditation, they're the ones battling it now. The worst decision this country had to make was legalizing all kinds of uh, uh, the doping situation. They thought it'd be easier to control the population. George Carlin made fun of it in the 70s. And it actually happened the way, exactly the way he said it. it started with Colorado, right? Yeah. He was talking about it in the seventies or eighties. I don't know what year he was talking about it, but yeah, he, he. I mean, he had a special every year or every other year. He was, he was one of the most uh, brilliant minds. You know, another another kind of interesting area that I've seen. You know, I know you spent some time in Glendale. I was in a wedding last year, uh, a wedding for a deacon, and we got our suits done in mm -hmm. an Armenian clothing store. We didn't know it was Armenian in advance. It was in Glendale. And they had an icon behind the register. And it was like, yo, you got to be either Armenian or Syriac. I knew that. And they ended up being Armenian. And I know there's some crossover there too, especially, you know, like you, you mentioned the Beiruti earlier, the folks of Beirut. No, no, no I, was, I was talking about the Armenians though. We were just, I know, like, I know, I know. Way. But th that's what I mean is they live side by side. Just like there's an Armenian church in Ethiopia, there are Armenians in Beirut 
there are also the Greek Orthodox, the Melkites. There's so many different groups. But what was interesting is, you know, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in Van Nuys, and I saw Armenian schools near me, church schools, Armenian church schools. I saw Armenian grocery stores, Armenian doctors, restaurants. And was so fascinating to me is I was having these discussions with some black leaders who focus on economic self-sufficiency. And it seemed like without having any of the Marcus Garvey influence, it seemed like the Armenians were on the same page. So I, I wonder if, do people ever discuss it or does it have anything at all to do with the church or is it a totally different part of the culture? The idea of like wanting to own your own banquet hall, like the idea of instead of working for somebody, having your own business, because I think this is a very honorable thing. And mm -hmm. I actually wish more Ethiopian Orthodox did that. I We still don't have a proper school. I want us to have our own schools, our own healthcare facilities and things like that. We do have our own grocery stores and our own restaurants. But I don't you know, see our own not, It's not really about having your own because you're not going to just tell people, oh, you're not one of us, leave. But people are kind of, it's like a campfire, bro. Everybody has the campfire. It's it's a vibe. You're going to like the vibe if you walk in. So you attract naturally whatever you're used to. Um, but as far as it goes, I'm going to actually ask you about Marcus Garvey in a minute. But um, Armenians stick together. Whenever things were gonna have, when things go down, they look out for each other. We look out for each other. It's a good thing. As far as it goes to the Marcus Garvey influence, he's the guy that declared Haley Salize as Christ Jesus, right? Is that the guy you're talking about? I don't think so. Uh, sure? I okay, could be wrong. I need, I need something. to, I need to read up more on his writings. But as far as I recall, he was a black Catholic. He was um, okay. So we're talking about someone else because. I have a very strong disagreement of Haley Salazé being persecuted and they call him Jesus the same way Marilyn yeah. Manson were looking at Those have kids. been the Rastafarians and there's a yeah. lot of crossover between Garveyites and Rastafarians, but they're not yeah. exactly the same. The Rastafarians established their own religion and even amongst them, they have so different divisions. Some people want to make him canonize the saint, which I would disagree with. Other people you know, actually deify him, like think of him as as God or the second second coming of of Christ. But as, yeah, the okay, Garveyites, so from my not, understanding, not were yeah. traditional Black Catholics in the Black Catholic tradition who also believed in economic self sufficiency and repatriating or going back to Africa. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But uh, I see Haley Sally's a uh, victim too. Uh, him bringing the culture back and bringing people back to Africa as a punishment. They kind of declared him as a uh, Jesus to kind of, you know, cut the head off the king. Because emperors and kings, they don't uh, allow each other to walk. I mean, why did they make the chessboard in the first place? You That's know, a good question. Like, I'm a chess player, like but I don't know the yeah, answer. Like when they asked Jesus, when, are you a king? He goes, man, you called me a king. I was never a king. What were they actually doing? The temple builders were basically going to be running things. And uh, Joseph was just a carpenter. And they kept saying, wasn't he Joseph's son? You know, so it's that same drama that Haley Salize had to go through. And um, if you really want to know, uh, the Solomon's Lament in the um, Ecclesiastics, they kept trying to yoke his neck with that law. And you know what? I know personally... Based on my information, he was, uh, Kaylee Salize was Ethiopian Orthodox, right? Yes. He was close with the bishop. He hated it when people called him Jesus because it's actually persecution. Because the non-Christians and the pagans, they would say, where's my animal? That's my Jesus. And they would keep, you know, it was it was, a, it was like a voodoo ritual against the guy, man. The guy had to go back to Ethiopia and then he had a problem with uh, Italians, right? They took him, supposedly. Or he had a good way to escape. I don't know. I don't know exactly what happened. But um, Haley Salize is just another example of a persecuted Christian that didn't put his cross down. And that's what they're going to do to a lot of us. They're going to say, yeah, he's our Jesus. And they're going to, they're going to, they, they have other concepts of that too. Oh yeah, you tupac yourself or whatever you're going to do. <laughs> it's a satanic attack, bro. You know what I mean? And it becomes a tradition according to a faith that's far from Christianity. And uh, that's, all, that's always going to happen. They're going to tell you, oh, he's a king. Why am I a king? You know? I mean, yeah, you were married at our church. We declared you king and queen. Go to your family, man. Leave me alone. I'm not a king. You know what I mean? So it's that, um, I think it's communism. They call it communism now. But before that, it was something else. You know what I mean? Do you yeah, know what we, I'm talking about? Or is it kind of like... Yeah, they, there, there is a lot surrounding the king 
And, you know, he actually had some weak moments I've heard testimony of where, you know, if enough people call you a deity or God or mix that glory, you know, however humble you are, it's like the ring in Lord of the Rings. Even the most innocent human being, any power can corrupt them. So I think sometimes it actually did go to his head. But overall, he he was very good. And he sent bishops and priests to preach the true persecuted Christianity that you're talking he about. Was, he was under a knife, bro. He was afflicted. I'm going to bring more information based on what he testified. And I'm going to put the connections together. Um it sounds beautiful. Let, let's let's do some some last parting advice because one of the things you said to me earlier really stuck out to me was there was a time where you were saying that there were some horrible things happening back home and one of the ways that you wanted to cope, one of your mechanisms for making meanings was finding God but in a slightly different lens through your sister churches. But you you encountered different languages that you didn't know. So can you give some sort of parting last advice for for members of our communion, for all the Armenians, all the Ethiopians, all the Eritreans, all the Syrians, all the Egyptians, and all of the Indians, and all of the converts that we've had in our church? What mm. advice can you give them for basically standing, not just sitting, but standing through a liturgy in which they may not know all of the words that are being spoken? Right. The number one approach to approach God, if you really believe him and you really want to submit to him, I'm not trying to change any minds. I'm not trying to bring anybody from the outside. This is for people who are trying to struggle to stay in, okay? Just let go and trust whatever is being chanted by the priest that you were baptized into. I'm not trying to convert anybody because right now we're stuck under this other knife. It's like, oh, you were baptized when you were a child, but did you know what you were being baptized to? If you want to know, educate yourself. But, I mean, I didn't know when I was being born from my mom. I don't have to do it again. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense. I have a child with my wife. Tomorrow, I'm going to make sure my kid is born in my family, not by my neighbor's family or the TV broadcaster's family just because they decided to watch TV, you know? So, yeah, they're born into my faith too. And if they're going to make a decision to walk away later, it's their decision. But don't come to me as a Christian in the name of Christ and try to hack their heads off. Not literally. We're not in the Middle East, but you know what I mean. So when it comes to not understanding, yeah, do your effort to understand, but don't show your language. Because, yeah, uh, if, if the apostles left the Judea and they left their culture behind, supposedly, they didn't speak their language, which is not true, because in Armenia there were a lot of Jews. That's how they communicated. Okay? And uh, the entire Old Testament is their culture right there. So if you're going to bring the Old Testament, that's already Jewish history. That's already Jewish culture. The fulfillment of Christ can be applied only by the other cultures and the Jews who embraced it later, who later became Christians. So if I'm going to go ahead and throw away my Armenian language because I don't know it or I don't want to know it or I knew it and I forgot it, I'm going to go ahead and erase 2,000 years of my uh, testimony that I could have inherited just by being born into that faith, where then later I could have made it grow. Versus me saying, you know what? I don't care about culture. I don't care about anything else. I'm going to go ahead and do exactly what the NIV version wants me to do, which is only like, what, 65% of the Bible that my people believe in. You know, and it's a lot of change in words, too. And another thing, one more advice, if you're going to be sticking with the English language, don't go with just one translation because of that, I don't want to call it verbiage, but um, you stick with that one term, especially that one sentence, it can mean something completely different if, if you don't look at the whole picture of what the scripture is trying to teach you. In that same language, different versions. Yeah, that one word, it's going to be stuck in your head. That's how the devil's going to play with you. So, yeah, culture is a big thing. You got to be literate. If you don't want to be literate, just stick with the faith. Just believe in the path that everybody's following together. Yes, it's your God, but it's not a personal relationship. God is God's purpose is so everybody could be in the community together. together. Now, if I go to an Ethiopian Communal. liturgy, I don't understand anything that's going on. Me bowing in that uh, humble state brings me closer to you because it's beyond the language, it's beyond the culture. I think me and you will have a better time tackling much more difficult problems than if I had to come and say, you know what? I read the translation. This word doesn't sound right. I want to make a debate with you. No, that's your church, bro. And if that's my sister church and I come to you like that, that means I'm not even really from my church either. 
I believe my fathers knew what they were doing with your fathers when they came together. So um, I'm going to make it clear. So we got to embrace our cultures. We're not going to let it go. We're not going to let it go. Because if we do, our kids are not going to keep what we kept. Language is key. When the cops were invaded by the Arabs, the number one problem they faced was if they spoke their language, they would have their tongues cut off. Wow. Soon after the, the cops were destroyed, the Arab invaders came to Armenia and they started having a problem with us. And we had that same struggle. Our, our communion with the cops kind of kept us strong in that sense. But we have an epoch about that. And now today, Armenians want to talk about how uh, that's actually a pagan tradition. It's not a pagan tradition. We've had a, we have our pagan traditions too. The epoch is how the Arab invaders came and tried to destroy Christianity after Islam was introduced to the world. And if you want to know something similar that happened in that chaos, chaos happens all the time. There's a different version of that chaos before Christ, 4,000 years ago with Hike. So we've all had our times of what really happened. But if we didn't hold on to our culture and our neighbors and our common, not denominators but we all have one god if we don't embrace each other for that same faith if you let go of your culture i let go of my culture what good will we work today what, what good would it be today how could you come to my home or how could i come to your home how's that gonna work you know what i mean like the bread's different in the ethiopian church it's a little darker they give you more uh the wine Right? It's more like matcha. It's not the wine. It's the wine that's not made yet, right? It's like juice. Right? Isn't it darker? It's uh it's it's funny. The some of the clergy freak out when people talk about it publicly. But yeah, there there is um there's a debate between actually different bishops about how to do that. And one of our archbishops, the archbishop of California, he actually made a decision at one of the synods and what he did is he, he told people the history. So the history was that the Islamic or Arabic rule that you're talking about over the cops during that period, they said these Christians are getting drunk. And so they have them stop drinking wine for the sacrament. Whereas in the Bible, everywhere it says wine, you know. Um, and so because the Copts were our overseers, because they were in charge over the Ethiopians, they imposed this upon the Ethiopians because of the Islamic caliphate that was barking orders at them. So through an Islamic caliphate, through a Coptic patriarch and synod, the Ethiopians were told to change their practice from wine to begin having a practice of squeezing raisins and, and getting the, the juice from those raisins. And so now there, there are two main practices. Mostly in Ethiopia, it's just the, the raisins being squeezed. But in the diaspora, um, people use a lot of times uh, wine. Isn't it the pre-wine? It's, it, it, isn't it the material that turns into wine later? It's kind of a darker juice flavor. But it's actually it's without alcohol. We it's have different. that in Armenia. We drink that all the time on our tables. It's, it's the wine that's not prepared yet. But I don't know how um, we get really drunk from it. It's really good. But I mean, it's, it's the good stuff. I'm telling you right now. But um, right now, we have a different problem, bro. We're walking six feet apart from each other for social distancing. Why couldn't it be seven? Think of it like that. So are we going to allow that to stop us from praying together? Because now it's six, 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 six feet from each other just so we won't get sick. I like the way our King David steals Goliath's knife and cuts him off, you know. I'm not going to let these symbols take me away from who I am or the cross or anything else. If Christ was our immunity, our deliverer, our uh, savior, we're supposed to be the protectors. Christ is not going to come and protect us. He's the immunity. He's the antibody. He's going to go ahead and deliver us and save us. But if it's not going to be our hands, our minds, our, our words in exchange, we're just going to end up delivering our kids to the wrong hands, if you know what I mean. So we got to brave it up, man. We got we to gotta step up. Um, there's a lot of conflict. And the number one thing is if you want to destroy an entire country or culture, you kill the spirit first. And that's the constant threat that we've been under, whether it's a caliphate back then or it's another presidential run now. I mean, I can't stand the elections because every time that's that season's coming, everyone's angry. Yeah. Nobody agrees. I don't want my family arguing over about that stuff. And I don't care. You know, I really don't care, bro. I don't care. You know, nobody, everyone's always hyped up and angry over stuff that doesn't matter. It's an energy that's just 
driving people insane. And um, we just got to keep growing that hope because it's, it's getting worse. That's all I'm saying. Agreed. We, we need to focus on hope, dig into our culture, our ancient languages and tongues, and focus on holding on to the faith. And we need to pray that there is a, a vaccine or whatever other remedy that needs to happen soon so that we could begin to get together. It's a good exercise in six months of everybody being a hermit, mm -hmm. but it's a uh, time for us to uh, reunite with one another. Thank you so much, Deacon, uh, Subdeacon Hoven, for joining my program. Uh, it's been a pleasure. All right, brother. See you soon.